The FDA will not approve. Welcome everyone here. The news now from Fox. I'm your host, Mike Page. We wanted to take you out to this uh, breaking news that we are getting from President Trump's legal team regarding Pennsylvania, everybody. So let me just read this. Uh, coming here for you right here on News Now from Fox as we were just getting this in and then we are actually going to take you out uh, to Pennsylvania as well here. So just moments away from this update here as uh, Jenna Ellis uh, reporting this that uh, Pennsylvania court grants hearing in election integrity case challenging the constitutionality of Act 77. That's mail-in ballots here. So we're uh, hearing the order right now. It says now, November 25th, 2020, upon consideration of petitioner's motion for emergency injunction, the subsequent filings by the parties and the new allegations raised in petitioner's supplemental application for emergency relief filed at 11.42 p.m. on November 24th, 2020, it is hereby preliminary ordered and decreed there. And uh, so that is... In Important there, as Jenna Ellis is saying, the Constitution a law attorney there and senior legal advisor for President Trump is saying that uh, this is important because respondents are preliminary enjoined from doing so pending an evidentiary hearing to be held on Friday, November 27th at 11.30 there. So uh, that is the big news coming there. It looks like they will be having a hearing on this for the mail in the ballots there so we will continue to follow that here for you on news now from fox but i want to keep the breaking news coverage going here because we're going to now take you out to pennsylvania this is a public hearing by the pennsylvania majority policy committee to discuss 2020 election issues and alleged uh, problems the hearing will feature also former new york city mayor rudy giuliani as well let's listen into this different story that's why we're here today, again, as agents of public opinion. Senator Mastriano and his staff have assembled a number of witnesses who will share their experiences with us regarding the conduct of this year's election. Uh, we look forward to listening to that testimony. But before we turn there, I want to introduce uh, my good friend, our caucus administrator, and as of December 1st, our incoming majority leader. Uh, congratulations to Kim Ward. Thank you for joining us. Uh, please, Kim, your, your statement. Thank you, Senator Arbel, and thank you, Senator Mastriano, for inviting me to participate in what I think is very, very important to the people of Pennsylvania. As Senator Arbel had said, we have been inundated with calls and emails and messages in our social media. People are not feeling good nor confident about the process and the results because of that process. The president and his team deserve, this is a president of the United States, not the president of your middle school school board. So we need to uh, make sure that they have the room that they need to explore every avenue. So when this is over, we know that the process, what worked in it, what didn't work in it, and what we need to do to fix it, and what we may need to do to address it. This has been very, very uh, exhausting and hard on so many in Pennsylvania. And uh, I look forward to listening to what the testifiers and Mr. Giuliani have to say to us today. So thank you very much again, and um, thank you. Thank you, Master, Mr. Senator Mastriano. Thank you, Kim. Senator Mastriano, please. Thank you, Senator Argo and Senator Ward. Thank you for being here and supporting this here. And welcome, everybody, to this most, most historic occasion and this most historic town. And what happened here in 1863? I think today we're going to see a turning of the tide because we have not really heard the truth of the arguments made on the other side of what happened. And we're dealing with a government and leadership in Harrisburg that wants to close their ears to what's happened during this election. And sadly, many in the media that are complicit and want to write off what happened. So for me, on this battlefield and remembering what happened 157 years ago, especially 157 years ago last week, where Abraham Lincoln gave his most famous address, and I think his final sentence captures why we're here today. He said that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. And everything is at stake in what happened during this election cycle. Everything. The republic is at stake. This is no game for us. And for any veteran in this room here who wore the uniform, such as Major General Scott Perry, thank you for being here, sir. Um, uh, put their 
lives on the line here fighting for our country and to see that there is a group in this state and country willing to throw away our valuable and precious freedoms here for power. You know, for me, Mr. Mayor, it's going to be a fantastic hearing today. Despite pleas from our citizens, the governor refuses to even consider that there was any shenanigans in the elections here in our state. A state of 13 million people, and he wants to discount because his guy won that nothing bad happened. And that's just unacceptable. If there's any hint of fraud out there, we need to investigate. Any governor serving the people of this commonwealth would put aside his petty politics, would put aside his petty politics, and find out the truth if anyone was defrauded. And at this point here, he's unwilling to do that. Let me point out some hard facts here. Uh, we are in Adams County, named after our second president, John Adams, who famously said, facts are stubborn things. Let me lay out several of these inconvenient truths, as Al Gore would have us think. There have been many allegations of uh, voting law violations across the state, and a governor serving the people would have to move heaven and earth to ensure no one was defrauded. But yet, he's not moved to action. And even his Secretary of State, of course, says that, that there was no shenanigans of great concern. And uh, I'll remind everyone that I was a no vote on, a, on the confirmation of Kathleen Bookbar four times that I interacted with her. I asked her, why are elections in Afghanistan more secure than Pennsylvania? And she sat there and blinked and couldn't give me a straight answer. That, that, that elections are more safe and secure in a war-torn country devastated by conflict since 1979. Uh, what is going on here? The place where this all started in 1776 and we can't get an election right? you got to be kidding me here. And so as a result of her inaction, the governor's inaction, refusal to even look into any of the allegations and to discount the, the very essential freedoms of our, our citizens, we are here today to try to find out what the heck happened in the election. You know, and likewise our Attorney General, our senior law enforcement official here, you know, instead of being focused on making sure things are lined up in, the, in kosher. Before one vote was counted in Pennsylvania, the day before the election declared Biden the winner. I mean, it's, there's nothing to see here. Could you imagine if the shoe was on the other foot? Wouldn't the media be so gracious and merciful and kind if it was a Republican? <laughs> Absolutely not. And so, Houston, we have a problem here. You know, one of the most troubling things in this whole endeavor here, and it's not just because of the COVID, it's just a lack of transparency and accountability. So we're here to start shedding light on the darkness. And then, of course, we have a Supreme Court that rewrote election law. You know, Act 77 is impeded as a villain. We could debate that. But the real problem was is when the Pennsylvania Supreme Court decided they're going to write legislation and rewrite our law. And because of that, obviously, Pennsylvania, we got a lot of problems there. And that opened the door to all the shenanigans and abuses and folly that we're dealing with here in, in the state this day. So what's going on here? Thousands of people from across the Commonwealth have reached out to us, tens of thousands, uh, a asking and demanding action. They deserve it. And as a result of the inability of our executive branch to do their job, we're stepping in here. We're co-equal members, and we're going to do our job. We're looking for transparency and truth. There's going to be no grandstanding here. We're after facts. And we're going to have a good layout here of what happened. And you're going to have to decide, good people of Pennsylvania, on what happened. And whether there's a strong case we made or not. You know, the forgotten men and women are our great state feel betrayed by their government. And I'm with them. I feel the betrayal as well. So we undertake these proceedings today to find out what happened. And then hopefully have come up with an approach where it does never happens again. And the issues are galore. You're going to hear about poll watchers being denied access where election software vendors refuse to testify before the General Assembly, where they got to hide. Do we expect the people to trust their government? And we got to earn their trust. This is no game, and the very republic very much is at stake. And anyone who loves this country has to put aside their petty partisan politics and allow the light to shine where, where it is. And we're going to find the truth and celebrate it. You know, as a soldier, and now as an elected member of the state Senate, I'm not going to stand aside, and none, neither of the members around me are as well. We're going to fight the good fight for freedom and secure our republic. Too many good men and women have gone before us who are giving their lives here, and to cast it aside now for power play is unacceptable. It's not going to happen. We do our great men and women in uniform and those who lay down 
Their lives indeed a last full measure of devotion, a great disservice if we stand aside and allow bureaucrats and corrupt politicians to steal their voice and maybe even steal an election. We'll find out. John 8, 3, thank you. John 8, 3 to 6 says that if Jesus sets you free, you're free indeed. We're going to walk as free people in Pennsylvania. This is where we're all started. We each use this day to walk as free men and women in honor of the sacrifice not only of Jesus on Calvary, but also in honor of the sacrifice of brave men and women in uniform who fought for and secured our freedom. We will be relentless in our pursuit of the transparency of accountability and truth. The time for dithering, politics, and games is over. The time for truth and justice is now. In conclusion, as Benjamin Franklin was leaving Constitutional Hall in 1787, he was approached by Mrs. Powell. And Mrs. Powell ran up to him. We surmise she knew him personally. And she said, well, Mr. Franklin, what do we have? A monarchy or a republic? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. This is our time to keep this republic. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Mastriano. We turn now to the uh, introductions of our, our House and Senate members. Uh, let's uh, begin with uh, our, our representatives here at this end of the table. Gentlemen, ladies. Uh, yeah, Representative Dave Zimmerman, uh, serving the northeast part of Lancaster County. Representative Greg Roth from the 87th District, Cumberland County. Representative Mike Jones, 93rd District, York County. Representative Paul Schemmel, portions of Franklin County. Representative Rob Kaufman, 89th District, Northern Franklin County. Uh, Representative Stephanie Borowitz from the 76th District. <laughs> um, I'm honored to be here fighting for freedom, so thanks. Hi, Senator Judy Ward from Blair County, representing Blair, parts of Huntington, parts of Huntington, parts of uh, Franklin County, part of uh, Cumberland County, and all of Fulton County. Wow. You've already met Senator Kim Ward. I believe you know Senator Mastriano. There we go. Good afternoon, I'm Senator Mario Scavello from Monroe, Northampton County, and I can see New Jersey from my district. Senator Mike Regan from Cumberland and York County. Good afternoon, State Representative Dan Mal. Welcome to my 91st legislative district. Representative Frank Ryan from Lebanon County, Breakaway Pro. Thank you. We are also uh, joined on Zoom Senator Brooks and Senator Hutchinson from Northwestern Pennsylvania, Senator Yaw from the Williamsport area, Senator Stefano from Southwestern Pennsylvania, Senator Laughlin from Erie, Senator Martin from Lancaster County, Senator Pittman from Indiana County, Senator Pat Brown from the Lehigh Valley. Also, uh, my, my job as chairman is to remind our panelists to keep their microphones muted until it is your turn to speak, and also remind everyone to strictly observe our time limit. Uh, one other reminder to our senators and witnesses at the request of our Senate attorneys, uh, this is a legislative hearing. Our purpose is to listen to the complaints of our constituents, the oversight of government agencies, and the need for possible legislation. Stay right here with us, folks, on News Now from Fox, taking a quick two-minute break. Um, Senator Mastriano, I believe you want to introduce our first witness for 15 minutes. And we will hold, to the representative of the senator, so you understand, we will hold all of our questions until the conclusion of the sixth panel. I would just simply say, welcome to America's Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Giuliani, for being here. Pennsylvania. We are very, very honored and very appreciated.
appreciative that you are giving us an opportunity to be heard, which we've been denied almost uniformly by the media and by uh, legislatures elsewhere. Uh, all, we, all, all we ask is that you listen to the facts that we're presenting and then evaluate it. Um, I can't help but note that we're doing it here in Gettysburg <laughs> Over 156 years ago, the fate of our country hung in the balance right, right here on this hollowed ground uh, for three relentless days of bloody close combat between uh, two armies that lost over 50,000 casualties. The fate of our republic was really uh, decided that we'd be one nation, one union, one government, sharing uh, values that are enormously important to us. And uh, I don't want to overstate it, but I do believe that those values are at stake, not only in this election, but in the way this election was conducted and what we're going to do about it. Because if we allow elections in the future to be conducted the way this election was conducted, we will have lost our democracy, our representative democracy. Uh, during the course of this election, We've come pretty close to losing our right of free speech. Uh, there's been censorship that I've never seen before uh, of an incredible nature by big tech, big networks, big companies. Uh, they only allow one side to be heard and they refuse to allow the other side to be heard. It's almost as if they're afraid the American people, if they should learn these facts, will um, find out just who they are and what they're about. Uh, this uh, voter fraud that took place, which as you will see from the witnesses that we call, had several dimensions to it, several different ways in which it was done. The most, the most dangerous thing is, it is very, very similar in at least six states that we've been able to study. In other words, what we're going to describe to you with these witnesses happened in roughly the same way in Michigan, Wisconsin, Nevada, Arizona, and Georgia. Primary uh, device were the mail-in ballots. You know there was a fierce debate over whether we should have mail-in ballots in the first place. Uh, many scholars, many uh, experts always felt that mail-in ballots were very dangerous because they're very easy uh, to forge it leads to more defrauding. Uh, we were warned by uh, Justice Souter, among others. We were warned by President Jimmy Carter and former Secretary of State James Baker in a report that they did on how to make elections more secure. They warned us that the one thing to do is do not go to general mail-in voting because every place it's been used, it's led to tremendous fraud. And uh, that was reiterated, believe it or not, in an article in the New York Times in 2012, an article they have now forgotten they wrote, uh, that explained the same, the same thing. Um, and I think what you're gonna find as you study your mail-in ballot procedure here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and then in the six other places, uh, this, this was a terrible mistake. And it allowed the, the leadership of a party that had become pretty expert at voter fraud to really go wild. So the witnesses we present are going to first show you that in the case of Philadelphia and in the case of Allegheny County and one or two other counties, the mail-in ballots that were received uh, were not inspected at all by any Republican. They were hidden from Republicans. Uh, in the case of Philadelphia, and Allegheny County, I can't be absolutely certain, but I do believe the witnesses will show that a Republican never got to see a single ballot. Now, you know how important that is to determining whether it is a valid ballot or not. There's only one time you get to do that, and that's when you separate the envelope that possesses the verifying information from the ballot. The moment you separate them, you can no longer verify. You can't go back and recount, you can't go back and check paper ballot against uh, the machine ballot because it's a private ballot, it's an anonymous ballot, we want to keep it that way. 
the only thing that identifies it is that outer envelope. At that moment, when they're separated, gone forever. That's the moment at which inspections have been allowed, time immemorial, in America, Pennsylvania, all over other 49 states. Several of the witnesses here have been doing this for 20 or 30 years. They've never heard of the situation in which the mail-in ballot was just put in without allowing a Republican, a Democrat, even third party members to take one look at it and object to it for the very reason that it's too prone to fraud. Think about this. In your state, Republicans were uniformly not allowed, kept out, put in chutes like they were cows to keep them away from seeing these ballots. Never happened before. Not only that, the same thing was done in Michigan, the same thing was done in Wisconsin, and on and on and on. What's the chance that on the morning of November 3rd or 4th when they started the count, that in each one of those places, the Democrat leadership of these highly controlled Democrat cities that have some history for corruption, and in the case of Philadelphia, a long history of voter fraud. I could show you the convictions. I don't, I don't think I have to. Uh, what, are the, what are the odds that they're all going to wake up with the same idea? After years and years of always examining together absentee ballots, all of a sudden, in a year in which we have a couple million of them per state, we're not going to allow any Republicans to see them. Uh, the person in Philly figures that out. Pittsburgh, Detroit, Milwaukee, Las Vegas, Nevada. Or is it more likely that this was a common plan that maybe started with the whole idea of having mail ballots because it gives you a much wider range to cheat. When you had just a small number of absentee ballots, like 400,000, you have a certain range that you can cheat. When you have 250 or 2.5 million, you have a much bigger range to do that. So when you hear that testimony about not being allowed to see the ballot, you have to understand it's much more important than just that individual, just that individual uh, ballot. On election night, when I went to sleep, maybe when you did, uh, President Trump was leading in your state by somewhere around 700 to 800,000 votes, depending on when you went to sleep. That's a huge number of votes. 65% of the vote had been cast. Under normal circumstances, like if this were a fair media, your state would have been called for Trump. I mean, Virginia was called with 10% of the vote. It turned out to be separated by 1%. I think we may have actually won Virginia. But that's another battle. Michigan, we were ahead by 300,000 votes. Wisconsin, more. Georgia, we were down to 90% and ahead. What are the odds that they all switched overnight? They just switched by the next day. I think you're going to see how that. I think you're going to see how that happened. And I think there are a couple of statistics that you have to really closely, you have to really closely look at. I'll just mention them, and then we'll move on to the witnesses. We have calculated, and the evidence will show, that there were 682,770 mail-in ballots that were entered into your votes in just Allegheny County and in Philadelphia that were not observed by any single Republican. Those ballots could have all been for Joe Biden. They could have all been for someone else. They could have had no identifying data. They could have been from the same person. There could have been multiples of them. There could have been no name on them. We have no idea if that's true. Uh, and it will be very hard now to kind of put them together. You could ask and you could subpoena all of the outer envelopes. It would be very interesting to take a look at the 682,770 outer envelopes. It would be very interesting if they were kept. And it would be very interesting to see how many of them weren't filled out. But in any event, under the law of your state, which is set by you, those ballots are illegal. Uh, the judge, mistakenly in his opinion, said that we want to disenfranchise six million people. We don't want to disenfranchise anyone. We want to, we want to disqualify 682,000 votes so that 74 million people are not disenfranchised. Because that's, that's what happened by the cheating that went on here. 
I'll give you one other enormously puzzling statistic. You sent out in the state of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania 1,823, 148 absentee or mail-in ballots. You received back 1.4 million approximately. However, in the count for president, you counted 2.5 million. I don't know what accounts for that 700,000 difference between the number of ballots you sent out and the number of ballots that ended up in the count. That number, 2,589,242, was on your government website until yesterday. And yesterday it was removed without explanation. I'm going to be very interested in hearing what the explanation is. And I can't imagine you could possibly certify without knowing the explanation of that as well as the explanation to the 22,686 mail-in ballots that were returned on the day they were mailed. That's a trick. How about uh, they were returned, how about 32,591 were returned the day after they were mailed? Another 20,000 were returned <laughs> before they were mailed. Of course, this is only, this is, I think this is a kind of a low count, and I, I guess the crooks in Philadelphia are disappointed in this. They only submitted 8,021 ballots from dead people, mail-in ballots for dead people. Probably easier for dead people to submit mail-in ballots than it is to vote in person. You, you had about 30,000 of those. We're checking the records of the cemeteries around Philadelphia. You have 4,984 mail-in ballots that were never requested, and on and on and on and on. <coughs> your, uh, uh, your election, because of these two counties and maybe one other, is a sham. It's a disgrace to your state. And finally, I, I don't need to remind you of this. I think I need to remind America of this. Uh, the election for you know, President of the United States is not run by the governor of your state. It's not run by your election commissioner. The United States Constitution makes it clear who has the responsibility for running this election. Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2 of our Constitution. Now, it doesn't say that ABC gets to call the winner or CNN. It says... Each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. It's the state legislature that controls this process. It's your power. It's your responsibility. And uh, I, think you, I think you know, and you have to convince the rest of your members, Republican and Democrat, they owe that to the people of your state and they owe that to the people of the United States. Because if this happens without consequence, if they can just enter 600,000 some odd mail-in ballots without allowing a single Republican to, to view it, what's to say that next time they won't do a million? Or two million? I know crooks really well. You give them an inch and they take a mile, and you give them a mile and they take your whole country. So now we'll proceed with the witnesses. that we have also been joined on Zoom by Senator Kristen Phillips Hill, uh, Representative Don Kiefer, Representative Barb Glein from Central Pennsylvania, Representative Darrell Metcalf from Butler County, and Senator Langerhoek from uh, Johnstown area. Uh, Senator Mastrano, would you like to uh, introduce our next uh, panel uh, for the, uh, uh, looks to me, like uh, several people for uh, 15 minutes uh, as well. Yes, thank, thank you, Senator Argo. So uh, our witnesses, uh, come. first off, uh, Jenna Ellis, do you have any comments for the floor? Or? Thank you. Uh, legal, legal advisor to President Trump. Thank you very much. And um, I'll reserve my comments for the end, and I would just echo uh, everything that the mayor so eloquently stated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Washington. So we, uh, we'd like to call forth uh, Justin Queter from Philadelphia. Justin, are you here? Okay, outstanding. If you can come up to the table, please, my friend. And Kim Peterson out of Pittsburgh. Kim, are you here? Come forth, please. <laughs> we have a seat for you here. All right, as we get ready for those next witnesses, we will uh, take a quick two-minute break for some of you right here on News Now from Fox. Stay with us. Kayla, could you push those two chairs over? Thank you. And that American flag is mine. If you set it on the table, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. And then um, Greg Stentrum from Delaware County. You're zooming in, I believe. Oh, he's there? Yeah, of course I met you. Come on over, brother. Okay. If you can, uh, uh, among yourselves, please. Uh, divide up the next uh, 15 minutes, and again, we'll hold all questions until the end. Please begin. I'll start. Thank you, Senators and Representatives, for inviting me to this important hearing. My name is Justin C. Queter, K-W-E-D-E-R. I am a resident and registered voter in the city and county of Philadelphia. I'm an attorney, I am barred here in the Commonwealth. I am a volunteer certified GOP canvas observer. I was present at the Philadelphia Convention Center during the pre-canvas, canvas processing and counting of the ballots cast in this year's general election. I was first present as an observer at the Convention Center and at the count on election day. I returned as a volunteer observer to watch the process every day for the next 10 days I'd approximate I was there for about 85 hours over those 10 days. Part of the reason that I kept going back was so that I could authoritatively speak about what I saw. And again, thank you for letting me be here. Because what I saw was problematic, to say the least. I can tell you that I am an eyewitness to many issues and irregularities that were observed in Philadelphia with the processing and counting of the vote. I was a witness to too many issues and irregularities to cover in a brief opening statement. And as such, I will now focus on just two issues that I did personally observe. First, the Philadelphia Board of Elections processed hundreds of thousands of mail-in ballots with zero civilian oversight or observation. The mail-in ballots were handled, processed, opened, and counted in Hall F of the Convention Center. Hall F is a vast room, approximately 350 feet by 350 feet. That's about 120,000 square feet. The Board of Elections erected a fence approximately 50 feet into the hall, 